dawn, a beach in Florida, the setting for one of nature's most mysterious rituals. For thousands of years, sea turtles have been visiting these shores to nest. Sharing the beach with man has always been hazardous. Now turtles are falling victim to a new and often fatal disease. On this beach, just south of Cape Canaveral, Florida, ready for the world. a team of conservationists is giving nature a helping hand. A nest of leatherback turtles has failed to emerge after their normal incubation period. Unusual heat and rain have packed the sand down, trapping the babies beneath. Was there a uh, we'll crust or cap or anything that may have prevented them from emerging normally? They seem well, to really want to be out. David Godfrey is director of the CCC, the Caribbean Conservation Corporation. He's helping Dr. Liu Earhart and a team of researchers with the rescue mission. They're real lethargic. Think some of the ones underneath might be a little better off? Or? Uh, I don't know. They might, they might be, be worse. Yeah. One's ready to go. Yeah, that's the one that looked lively as soon as it came. Hang on, hang on, get a live one. Really? Yeah. The team acts just in time. That that? These two guys are gone. Here's a that live one. Alive. What do you want? Oh, this guy's happy. He's still he's deformed now. That's simplified. We ought to do. Just take these and create an, create an emergence. I, I, I think we can. Eight, nine, the conservationists have developed 10, 11, an emergency rescue 12, method. Water revives the baby turtles. Then the team covers them in loose sand so they can dig themselves free in the normal fashion. in order to give them an opportunity to emerge naturally out of a nest and, and imprint uh, on this beach and, and, and head on down as a group and orient properly toward the water. We went ahead and put them and just added about two inches of sand back on top and let them emerge uh, as if a natural emergence was taking place. All sea turtles begin life this way. The females lay their eggs on the beach, having mated at sea. Once they've emerged, the hatchlings return to the water. What you're seeing is an act that's a hundred, hundreds of millions of years old. Some of these tiny creatures will one day return to this exact beach and repeat the ritual. They will lay their eggs where they themselves were born, but only a few of them will make it. A lot of hazards between this emergence into the water and when they come back. Um, the chances are uh, that maybe one or, or two or less of, of this actual nest will ever grow up to reach maturity. So everything we can do to help them at this point uh, helps their cause. Turtles are extraordinary animals with a unique life cycle. Having left the beach, they swim to the open ocean, where many feed on floating sargassum weed. As juveniles, they migrate again to offshore feeding grounds. It may take them 50 years to sexually mature. Then they migrate once more, thousands of miles back to the exact beach where they were born. It's one of the most remarkable feats of the animal kingdom. From birth, sea turtles are solitary. It's thought they may live for a hundred years, but there is no known way of working out their age from their appearance. They spend most of their time underwater and live at least 90% of their lives at sea, even though they breathe air and nest on land. 
the typical uh, nesting process takes about two hours to, to finish from the time they crawl up until the time they go back down after having deposited their nest and, and disguised the whole area. Nesting takes place at night. In order to disturb this female as little as possible, the scientists are using red filtered light. Some people often ask how long sea turtles can actually stay out of the water. Well, of course, they're, they're air breathing reptiles and although they very rarely ever come out of the water, they actually can survive for up to weeks at a time on land. Today, all eight species of sea turtle are either threatened or endangered, but there are initiatives to help protect them. This 20 mile stretch of Florida coast is a conservation refuge for sea turtles. Here, leatherbacks, loggerheads, and green turtles all nest safely. This prime stretch of coast is looked after by the CCC. David Godfrey must keep a close eye on not just the turtles, but their human neighbors too. You've got virtually every activity you can think of. There are businesses in here, you've got single family residences, golf courses, uh, condominiums. Uh, everyone wants to be as close as they can to the beach. People are attracted to the area because of the turtles, because of the beach, because there's so much uh, public land set aside for preservation. People want to be near that. It's clear to see that you really have to share this beach between sea turtles and surfers and a lot of other types of user groups, as we call them. There are a lot of fishermen out here, and of course, the surfers are everywhere. So as long as we cooperate and everyone sort of chips in and does their part, sea turtles and endangered species can coexist with man in a place like this. Far out at sea, turtles are even more at risk. Thousands are killed every year by fishing nets and plastic debris. These air-breathing animals become trapped and drown. This stretch of Florida coast is not just a place where adult turtles come to nest. It is also an important habitat for developing juveniles. It's these young turtles that conservationists are particularly worried about. They're concerned about a new threat to the beleaguered turtle population, a mysterious disease that may be caused by pollution in the water. Ordinarily, we don't work when uh, the wind's out of the southeast. Yeah. We hardly ever are out there, but... Yeah. Dr. Earhart and his team of students are monitoring the health of juvenile green turtles living here in Florida's Indian River Lagoon. The team regularly nets turtles in order to run health checks on them. David Godfrey accompanies them on the trip. They go to a, a standard site where they set out a long net that just sits in the water. And there's so many juvenile turtles out there that uh, just the mere fact that the net is there over a period of time, it just gradually starts catching them. Uh, the students and, uh, travel along the net uh, constantly, uh, monitoring to see if any turtles have been ensnared. Little green turtle. It's not long before the first turtle is hauled onto the boat. It shows the telltale signs of the new disease. This one looks like it might have one on the eye. Oh, yeah, really? It yeah, got one on the right eye. Mm. Yeah. It just well, keeps growing into right, this massive broccoli type tumor. And it literally blinds them. One of the major threats that we're very concerned about is the spread of. Uh, fibropapillomatosis, or, or papillomas, as we call it for short. Uh, these are uh, horrible growths, tumors, that are appearing on juvenile sea turtles, especially green turtles, uh, that are found in intercoastal waterways uh, in a number of parts of the world, uh, particularly yeah. here. These are, this, this would be a fairly mild case. Uh, we've been getting uh, a lot of severe cases lately. If you can imagine uh, tumors or, or growths like this 
as big as a tennis ball on this turtle's eye. It hasn't completely occluded its vision yet. And on the other eye, there's one starting as well. Uh, it's almost as big. It will not be able to see to feed and to avoid predators. About 60% of the turtles that, that exhibit the disease, or as the veterinarians say, present the disease, yeah. uh, have, have growths on the eyes. Some of these tumors are a little bit more... These growths are a bit of a mystery to scientists. Uh, there's a lot of research being conducted around the world to find out exactly what's causing them. Wherever there's a lot of uh, development along the coast, there's a great deal of runoff of chemicals and, and various types of pollution into the waterways. This may be causing the immune systems to deteriorate a bit in these sea turtles, uh, making them more susceptible to various organisms and, and viruses that have been around for a long time. It's ready to go. Uh, but the combination of, of these factors is causing it to explode. It's an epidemic. Live long and prosper. The researchers' evidence suggests that in juvenile turtles, the disease usually leads to death. They've found young green turtles to be particularly susceptible. So far, scientists have found no way of treating the suspected virus. Researchers are working to isolate the causes and to find a vaccine. As usual, resources are limited. These netting expeditions help to gather information for the immunologists back at the labs at the University of Florida. A turtle could drown if it got trapped in a net. So research assistant Dean Bagley pays close attention and acts quickly when one is caught. And our job now is to keep an eye on the snorkelers on the net and, and watch for them to holler that they've found a turtle in the net. Then we'll run in there and if they need help, we'll drop somebody off to help them untangle a turtle. If they don't need help, we'll just pick up the animal and put it in the boat. around some. We don't think that they're stressed very much. Probably the most stressful part is when they're in the net, and that's why we try to get them out so quickly. I can still use this one, right? With four green turtles safely on board, the team tags them, then performs some medical tests. I'm drawing blood from a cervical sinus. Blood gets used for a number of different things. Um, we use it for genetics work. We use it for uh, testosterone analysis so that we can get a sex ratio of the population and we also work in conjunction with some immunologists up at the University of Florida in Gainesville that uh, look at antibodies and things of that nature. Well done, turtle. The average size is about 40 centimeters and uh, so, so more, more than likely they're they're comparable, they're either comparable populations or part of the same population and that's one of the things we're looking at. Each day at dawn during the nesting season, Dean and other researchers patrol the shoreline of the Florida refuge. Before the sand is disturbed by the public, they collect information about turtle trails made during the night. This provides important clues about the new generation and how the species is surviving. We're usually up and on the beach before the sun comes up, usually around six o'clock or so. We run down the beach on these ATVs and we count how many nests and how many non-nests there were from the night before. It takes four of us to cover our, our particular nesting beach. We have about 28 miles of beach that we look at each morning. We don't 
have enough information about sea turtles, and this is just one way that we can try to find out whether the species is declining or, or growing. The CCC has invested in state-of-the-art satellite technology, the only way to effectively monitor the population across wide expanses of ocean. David Godfrey is enthusiastic about the new possibilities. The CCC recently started a, a very exciting education program that's tied in uh, with some cutting edge research uh, that's now underway to determine where these turtles go after they've nested. It's very hard to track an individual sea turtle after it leaves the beach, it's, uh, once they go back into the open water. So we're using a combination of high tech uh, transmitters that are attached to the back of a few turtles uh, that send a signal to a satellite allowing researchers to literally determine where these turtles are moving. The transmitters are attached using a series of epoxies and fiberglass resin that hold the transmitter to the back of the, uh, the flat part of the turtle's back. The transmitters themselves can send signals for as long as the battery lasts, which is typically up to about a year, sometimes a little more. After the battery runs down, the device will eventually fall off the back of the turtle. The resin and other uh, materials that are used to attach it eventually break down in the salt water. After leaving Florida, green turtles find their way to feeding sites in the Caribbean. Tortuguero a thousand miles away on the northern coast of Costa Rica is a magnet for the species. It has the largest green turtle rookery in the world. David is on a mission. The team knows that many of the juvenile turtles in Florida originally hatched on the beaches of Tortuguero. They want to assess the impact of the papillomavirus here in Tortuguero compared to the juvenile turtles back in Florida. They've been found through genetic testing, many of them to be from actually the Tortuguero population. The work that we do to learn more about fibropapillomatosis occurring in this juvenile uh, population is directly related to the community of turtles that we're protecting down in Costa Rica. Here, where the rainforest meets the sea, the longest-running sea turtle protection program in the world carries out its vital research. Since the 1950s, turtle enthusiasts have been coming here to help biologists in their conservation work. We conduct all our activities each year out of a biological field station that's located just a few hundred yards north of Tortuguero Village. Each year, we bring in uh, a research coordinator, uh, this year who happens to be Sebastian Troeng. Tortuguero is a national park. Nesting turtles are spared the consequences of mass tourism. Here, there are no big hotels, no bright lights, and no inquisitive tourists to disturb the turtles. Unfortunately, egg poaching is an intrinsic part of the local economy. Turtle eggs can fetch as much as $5 a dozen, since they're considered both a delicacy and an aphrodisiac. The presence of the conservationists acts as some deterrent, but often the culprits are local children hoping to make money at market. A beach team has disturbed youths as they try to run off with a nest of eggs. Most likely the eggs are dead, because after six hours, even if they're moved, they die, but we're going to try to dig them down in the nest and right. just wish for the best. And um, Agustin? Sebastian acts quickly to save the eggs by getting the students to dig an artificial nest. I just make a little note saying, poached eggs reburied. Yeah. It'll be touch and go whether Mother Nature will allow incubation to continue. Okay. So, um, is it is 36 true that the next one? Yeah. Just make a field.
Rescue work like this is part and parcel of the nesting season for the conservation team. And the date you said? Yeah. At midnight, David, Sebastian, and the amateur biologists resume their nightly study program. They'll cover miles of beach in total darkness, trying to locate nesting turtles. team located a turtle as she emerged from the sea. Now they're waiting for her to dig a chamber in the sand for her eggs. They use red filtered lights so the female is disturbed as little as possible. Sebastian explains to the students the purpose of the examination that follows. The average here in Tortuguero is about 110 eggs. A say drop into his hand, his cat, and then let him drop into the egg chamber. Um, and the reason we do that is we want to find out whether the clutch size varies from year to year. Um, because that obviously have implications for population dynamics. Because if there's more eggs laid, then there'll be more hatchlings and more turtles in the future. 8.5. It's got very powerful fins, um, and um, they can throw sand behind them quite far. And if you go up at night, unless we don't use any light, um, and try to make out what the turtle is doing, it's, it's not too rare that you sometimes get a shower of sand straight into your eyes. The turtle is not crying because of the hard work she's doing, although obviously it is quite hard work. She's um, actually excreting excess salt, and that's how marine turtles regulate um, the, the um, salt level in their bodies. Because of the evidence of migration between Florida and Tortuguero, David is concerned that this turtle might have contracted papillomas. Is it too late to, to try to do a quick inspection of the turtle looking for papillomas? Uh, this turtle looks clean, it's got, hasn't got anything. We don't observe very much fibropapillomas here. Um, green turtles tend to um, either survive them or die from them. Right. And if they survive, they tend to recover. We're seeing sometimes up to 60 and even 70% of the juvenile green turtles uh, on the east coast of Florida showing signs of fibropapilloma. Here it's probably around one or two percent of the, yeah. of the adults. We inspect them closely, all the soft body parts, soft areas around the neck, top of the flipper, underneath the flipper. We need to do obviously a lot more study because it's unclear right now as to whether uh, the turtles, if they make it to adulthood, if it's just those that, that never got papilloma and the ones that we're seeing with it actually die, or whether they can actually beat it or in, in, uh, uh, recover from the disease uh, by the time they reach adulthood. Sebastian is seeing little sign of the disease in the older turtles of Tortuguero. But the researchers are still worried. An increase in Florida juveniles falling victim may result in a drop in the number of recently matured turtles returning to Tortuguero to breed. Between the flipper and the carapace. They must monitor the population carefully. With that information, we're able to determine that if we protect those major feeding and mating areas, uh, we're able to do a lot to protect the species. So the Caribbean Conservation Corporation and other groups have worked with the governments of the three main countries where these turtles travel. That's Panama, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. Uh, to get them to coordinate the protection of this primary habitat where this turtle lives its life. And we certainly wouldn't have known that information if we weren't out here on the beach year after year tagging the turtles and gradually learning where they go to. At daybreak, the team returns to the beach. They come across a green turtle who hasn't yet returned to the ocean. With some gentle coaxing, they send her on her way. So much of the work is done in the middle of the night and it's pitch black. And you can only you know, just make out the features of the turtle. When you get one that's here at, at the crack of dawn, you have the full light to really see how beautiful it is.
research itself is a very important tool for conservation because as we uh, learn where the turtles are going and exactly what routes they're taking to get there, we can devise strategies to deal with some of the threats that they might be facing. Well, there's a lot we can learn uh, and need to learn about this creature in order to understand how they survive and what we can do to give them a better chance of surviving.